Good morning. My name is Ben Simpson. I serve in the Office of Spiritual Formation. It is my joy, my honor, my privilege to welcome each one of you to Truett Chapel this morning. It is good and right for us to worship the Lord. It is good and right for us to celebrate the gospel. It is good and right for us to welcome the Holy Spirit into our midst to transform us, to lead us forward. It is good and right for us to be together as a fellowship. And it is good and right for us to worship. And so today, let us lift our hearts to the Lord. I want to invite Ryan Hodges to come and offer our opening prayer as we begin chapel this morning. Thank you. Let us pray. Lord, you are compassionate and merciful. You are patient, faithful, and just. Help us show compassion to others as you show compassion to us. Forgive our apathy, our indifference, our self-interest toward others, and transform these attitudes into kindness, charity, and love so that we may be one with you and one with each other. Holy Spirit, allow us to heed these words through word and song today. May we accept the challenge to be the face of Christ for others. And in your mercy, Lord, may we be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. May the peace of Christ reign in our hearts today and always. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Good morning, Truett. If you'll stand as we begin our songs of worship this morning, we're going to start with the song, Goodness of God. With every breath that I am 
grace of God Yes, I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God like to thank Adam Dubberly, who will be our coordinator of chapel worship this year, for leading us in worship. Thank you also, those in the band. Uh, in addition to serving uh, here in this capacity, Adam, who is a student at Truett, also serves as director of contemporary worship at the First United Methodist Church in Temple, where he's been since 2019. Uh, he's married to Lindsay. They have two boys, Lincoln and Hayes. And be kind to Adam because he has been a lifelong fan of the Texas Rangers. It's been a long year if you're a Rangers fan. I want to extend a word of welcome to two Doctor of Ministry cohorts, many of whom are with us this morning. Doctors Previn Vong, our director of our Doctor of Ministry program, along with Dr. Joel Gregory, Dr. Matt Snowden, and Dr. David Ritzema are those who are teaching. If you are a part of a DMIN cohort that are, is with us right now, would you please stand so we could recognize you? So very pleased that you all uh, are here to study and to add appreciably to our community. 
Each year, alumni of Truett Seminary give to a Truett Alumni Scholarship Fund. Then those who are on faculty and staff at Truett, who are themselves Truett alumni, gather together to pour over applications that have been made for the alumni scholarship. And it's my pleasure this morning on behalf of the Alumni Scholarship Committee to uh, award to three present students uh, Truett Alumni Scholarship Awards. The first of whom is Savannah Green. Is Savannah with us this morning? Come on up, Savannah. I'm also delighted to award a Truett Alumni Scholarship to Abby Grace Stuckel. You might know her as Bennett, Abby Grace Bennett Stuckel. Please come, Abby. Present with us via live stream this morning where he is doing his mentoring in India is Praveen Kumar Tien. Congratulations, Tien. Before I take my seat, may I welcome to the Truett Pulpit today, Katie Reed Hodges. Katie currently serves as Minister of Congregational Life at the First Baptist Church of Arlington, Texas. In this capacity, she serves the church through pastoral care, through preaching, and fostering congregational connection. Katie received her undergraduate degree from Stephen F. Austin, Go Lumberjacks, and her Master's of Divinity from uh, Truett Seminary. It is a joy to have both Katie and Ryan serving as co-presidents of the Truett Alumni Association. Grateful for their support, grateful for their service. Katie and Ryan enjoy uh, life together, uh, and in so doing, they uh, find their way to national parks, to Texas Tech football, all games? Okay, I guess. Uh, Texas barbecue and uh, their two uh, golden doodles whose names are Cheddar and Charlie. Okay, Cheddar and Charlie, they're two golden doodles. Um, we are so grateful for Katie coming this morning to preach God's word to us instructions for Christian living. At this time, Robert Hillier comes to read scripture. Robert. Our scripture is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 32. Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 32. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however is not the way of life you have learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need." 
Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. This is the word of the Lord. I am grateful to be here today. Um, Just parking in the parking garage and walking in and circling the building brings back a lot of nostalgia and good memory for Ryan and I. Um, This is bonus, this isn't really in the sermon, but Ryan and I met here. Uh, Technically we met at ACL, the music festival in Austin, but we don't remember it, but we have proven that we were there at the same time and we shook hands. Very memorable first impression, obviously. Uh, But then uh, soon after I came here, a year later Ryan came here and we met and got to know each other and admired each other from afar here at Truett Seminary. And so obviously walking the halls, being present here, Um, is positive and memorable uh, for each of us. And so we are super grateful to be here. Um, And we have a deep respect and love for Truett, as alumni presidents ought to, right? So, okay. Um, So as introduced with us, Ryan and I have these two golden doodles and we, we got them when the pandemic started and we had wanted some, but life didn't slow down and we got really lucky and got these golden doodles. And we don't have children, so we pour all that love into the doodles, and we often weigh them at making sure they're like healthy and fit. And so uh, the way we weigh the doodles is we put ourselves on the scale first, right, to to get the tear weight, then we step off, we grab a golden doodle, then we step on the scale. And I will tell y'all, around our house, that is about the only time I step on the scale, (laughs) or Ryan. We have no real interest in daily monitoring of our weight, except when we want to weekly or monthly monitor the weight of the doodles. (laughs) And so, uh, but when we do that, when we stand on the scale, we have to admit to one another that we're not where we used to be. But it's very healthy for us to look down at the scale and see the weight that it is, and not say, well, that's not really me. It's healthy for us to look at the weight before we grab the doodle and admit to ourselves, this is really where we are. (laughs) And I think as we look at this text in Ephesians today, it might be a really good invitation for each of us to say, this might be where we are. Maybe not even where we wish we were. And we may look at it and say, "Uh, that's not really me. But when we take a really honest look, down at our feet, it may be exactly where we are. And so for us today, um, let's look at this text with that spirit in mind. So I graduated Truett in 2015, and quickly after that became the college minister at First Baptist Church Arlington. And Dr. Dennis Wiles is our pastor, and he's a regent here at Baylor, he's taught here at Truett, he's a very familiar face around here. But just this summer, I've transitioned from being the college minister to the minister of congregational life. And so I hung up my college hat, and I did college all the way through uh, BSM, worked here at Baylor in the, as a chaplain in the dorms, and then six years there. So after 13 years of college ministry, I hung up my hat. Side note, we are searching for a replacement. <laughs> And I took on this new thing. And so in taking on this new role with Dr. Wiles, which we talked about, which is kind of his right-hand woman in all things pastoral, that's my job. So the day-to-day is whatever we need to do together, um, or can I do on his behalf to make the church run smoothly. And so in taking on this new role, one of my new responsibilities is liaising with the deacons and other church governing, governing bodies. Up until this point, I have only had one committee at First Baptist Arlington, and I was the staff liaison, and still am, to the women's committee, which is every female Truett grad's dream to get to a church and be given the women's committee. <laughs> part of it and I'm happy to do it. But until then I had just dealt with the women uh, and the women's committee, but now I am now in the upper echelon of dealing with the higher leaders in the governing body at First Baptist Arlington uh, just within the past few weeks. And here is what I will note, and I I would say this at the risk of insulting those whom I love and work with and serve with my career and my calling, is that it has been a bit of a surprise to, to walk into some of those meetings. I would even say it's been a bit disheartening to walk into some of those meetings um, because, and this is why, 
these are people who I know to be good and faithful and kind Christian leaders because I've worked with them for six years, yet in some of these meetings, as of late, they are not as good and faithful and kind in their words to one another and to our staff. And I've come out of it and told the pastor, I'm a little bit disheartened by what's going on in the life of our deacons right now. And I, I okay, I'm going to clarify this. We have a really good church full of really good people. Dr. Still, you remember there, only 25 years ago, 30 years ago, um, <laughs> when you were at DBU. Uh, it, here's what I'll say. Kenny Rogers says you need to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, and when to run. This is a hold them congregation of lovely people. This is not a uh, know when to run. Right? I know when to run. I've been there. This is not a when to run. This is a hold'em. With that said, they have been a little mean lately and a little mean-spirited to one another. But here's, what, here's the thing. If I look at the larger landscape around us, it is not localized to Arlington. It is not localized to First Baptist. It is not localized to the <laughs> ordained uh, deacons of First Baptist Arlington. And if I talk to you, you might say something similar about whatever organization you're a part of, whatever institution you're trying to lead or just the people that you're trying to live in community with. It is in the air. There's an insensitivity. There can be a paranoia. There's an apathy. We have a shared contempt for whatever's in front of us. It's everywhere. It is fascinating. It's a little surprising, and it's a little bit disheartening. And I'll admit, in general, I don't think we're all the most likable versions of ourself. My good friend and mentor in ministry, Tiffany Harris, came here today, which is very sweet. Tiffany, I saw you earlier. There you are. Uh, she actually convinced me to wear the blazer. I wasn't sure. Blazer on, blazer off. This is why, this is why we have mentors in ministry. Uh, so Tiffany and I were talking the other day, and she observed to me that she thinks, if we're really honest, a lot of people just don't like each other right now. And, and not in the drag down, uh, knockout, fight in the hallway kind of way, but in a, hey, let's get that Bible study back together. And then you realize you're super annoyed and maybe regretting initiating the invitation in any kind of way. And in the end, there's just this reality that we don't seem to be acting very Christian toward one another, if you know what I mean. And so with that in mind, I gravitated toward and chose Ephesians 4, the end of it for us today, this morning. And I pray that it can be for us and admit where you are on the scale kind of morning. I appreciate you reading it. Richard, is it Richard that read it? Robert? And apparently he was in your youth group so many years ago, which makes us old, right? <laughs> A little bit. So, okay, uh, but it's beautifully read and I appreciate it. And every word ought to be true. And if you have time today to sit with this, it is general instruction for Christian living that every Christian is, cannot get out from under. We joked, you can read Ephesians, and you don't have to know what fight is going on in the background. You, you don't have to know what was coming in. You don't have to know that the Judaizers came in, and they were trying to circumcise everyone, and that's how you know what, what Paul's really getting mad about. You can just read Ephesians and assume that it is for you, the Church of Jesus Christ, at any time and any moment, especially Ephesians 4, 17 through the end. And as I read this, and I'll point back to several verses in it, but I have been captivated by verse 32, which is the end of chapter 4, even though it goes into 5 a little bit. And it has these three admonishments from Paul to his people. Be kind, be tenderhearted, and forgive one another. And there's really no way around Christian living if you cannot embody those three principles in your life. The word for kindness, it kind of falls short in English. In Greek, it really takes all the, good, the goodness, all good and all kind, and it puts together in this one word. There's no adjective in English to describe it. It's good and kind in one way. We want you to be kind. You have to be kind to one another. If I could take people by the, by the back of the jacket, which is not a kind, I get that. I get that reference. But, and say, hey, you can't, you can't do this without being kind to one another. The word there for tender-hearted, if you're taking Greek here, um, Side note, my husband got the MBA while he was here, and so he did not take the languages. One of the main reasons he got the MBA while he was here. Uh, so I'll say to you, Ryan, Ryan, when they say tender-hearted, it's really, <laughs> it's really, uh, y'all know often when, when in the Bible it says heart, it's really talking about the gut. 
the splagna. And when it says tenderhearted, it's really saying be good in your splagna, in your internal organs, that gut feeling. When Jesus looks out at people and has compassion, he's tenderhearted, he's feeling it in his gut. You have to have this to be a Christian in this world. Yet, it's lacking. And then, of course, to be forgiving is pretty much the thing, right? You have to receive the forgiveness of Christ and then, and then give it to others. If you don't have those, we're out. We're out of luck. So Paul writes to the church that he's been pastoring, be kind to one another, be tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. And I'll say this, the authorship, the audience, the historical context of Ephesians is debated, and you're learning about that in your classes, but the scholars that I trust the most here, and my pastor, uh, they say it's okay that I say that Paul authored this letter and wrote it to the Ephesians. And so we'll go with that, and y'all can debate that in your textbooks later. Uh, so with that, Paul, in addressing the Ephesians, which we'll say safely, given that caveat, he begins this passage in scripture that we've started with, verse 17, and he says, I admonish you, actually I insist to you that you not live like the Gentiles live, because they have hardness of heart, and they have lost all sensitivity, and they've abandoned themselves. The Greek in verse 19 for lost all sensitivity is a word that's only used once in the entire New Testament and is used right here, and it literally means ceasing to feel, or your past feeling. You're beyond any sensitivity or emotion. So what do the Gentiles do? They've lost it. They've become callous. They stopped caring. And today, I wonder if we look at Paul's description of the non-believers, we might see ourselves mirrored back in that. Three years ago, I bought a house in Arlington, and I had moved from kind of a wooded lot with a lot of shade in South Arlington to a house in Central Arlington that had a lot of natural light pouring into it, and it was really nice. And our, our bathroom has this great big window with a lot of light coming in. And so the first morning, I woke up, and had moved into my new house, and I was getting ready for church the next day, and I look in the mirror, and y'all, it was jarring. Because what I didn't know is my mirror that I got ready in for two years at my little house with all the shade was not giving me the most honest look at myself than that new house was <laughs> two years later. And I'm telling y'all, it was honest, it was uh, somewhat humbling, <laughs> and it made me take a good look at everything going on in the mirror. And when we look at Paul's text, and he says, the Gentiles, the others, the people that are non-believing, they act calloused. They act like they've lost all their sensibility and their sensitivity to the world. They've lost their compassion. I wonder if we use this text as a mirror, if we don't see ourselves in it today. If I'm honest about myself, I see it in the way only that I interact. I mean, you don't have to go any further than social media. I'll be honest, if someone posts that someone is in the hospital and they need prayer, I'll go ahead and just think to myself, I wonder if they got the vaccine. I wonder how compassionate I'm going to be in this moment. Because if they didn't get, you know, come on, I'm not going to waste my time. Keep scrolling. If somebody posts something political, I go ahead and see who liked it from my church so I can go ahead and prejudge them on what side of the aisle they fall on before I really decide how sensitive I'm going to be to them. Like I'm not going to show up with my Bible and my prayer book if something's wrong. As if I'm, I'm going to decide in that moment, which I would never do. But it's in me. That's in me. And aren't we all a little bit callous right now? But if we're honest, of course we're calloused. Who could really blame us? We are in the throes of a pandemic that we thought would be completely over by now. All of us. We thought at First Baptist Arlington that we were shutting down for two weeks. 16 months ago, how naive in our spirit we were. We were trying to figure out if we could really do that Easter egg hunt on April 8th. Could we really do it? I know, it's, I know it's March 13. Can we really do that Easter egg on? That's what we were doing, and here we are. So we're in the throes of pandemic that we thought would be completely over by now. We've been through the most contentious election in my lifetime, I would argue all of ours. We've had unprecedented but not unpredicted climate crises. The refugee crisis is at our doorstep. The Middle East is as messy as it has ever been. We are nowhere near racial justice like we thought we might be. The Rangers have lost 85 games this season. Chris Beard left Texas Tech for UT Austin, and I'm gonna say it, things are looking really sour for the Big 12. 
Things are not good, so of course we're beyond caring, of course we're callous. Just look at your local emergency room or school board or PTA to see that we are all callous and past feeling and losing our sensibility. So let's pack it up, we're done for, we're no better than the Gentiles, right? If we're not gonna pack it up, then what do we do? How do we, Christians, climb out of the pit of despair? How does one move from hard-hearted to tender-hearted? For Paul, to the Ephesians, it's this. We must become pupils in the school of Christ. That's how F.F. F. Bruce puts it. In verse 20, the NRSV says it like this. That is not the way you learned Christ. For surely you have heard about him and you were taught in him and truth is in Jesus. He says, you learned Christ and it did not look like this behavior. So what is the answer to it all? How does one face the world and neighbor and not grow numb? For the Ephesians so long ago and for us here today, we enroll in the school of Christ and we never graduate. Many of you will graduate from Truett in the coming semesters. This, this whole thing has clear and defined goals. These degrees have finite amounts of assignments, courses, and credits. You will complete the program. You will complete the program. Claim it. <laughs> Name it, claim it. But you will never graduate from the School of Christ. You will never check all the boxes and receive all the credit until you reach your final rest in glory. Until then, true students, if you want to live kind and compassionate and forgiving and fruitful lives, you will be lifelong learners in the school of Christ. This is the way we learn Christ just as the early church did. So what does this mean for you? How will you become a lifelong student of Christ? Eugene Peterson says that you go no further than working the angles. He describes our ministry life as being like a triangle with three angles. And the angles hold it all together and without the angles, the shape no longer exists. It falls apart. What are the three angles Eugene Peterson says? Prayer, the reading of scripture, and spiritual direction. That is for him, the hearing a word from God on behalf of the people in front of you. Are you still doing LLLs? You gave them away. Come. Back when I was here, we did LLLs. They're called lifelong learning credits. What I was going to say is, <laughs> if you want LLLs in the school of Christ, you never leave the reading of the scripture, commitment to personal prayer, and the hearing from God on behalf of the person in front of you. This is the school of Christ. Dr. Jack McGorman, a Southwestern Seminary New Testament professor back in the day, was a mentor of Dr. Wiles, my boss. And he emphasized to his students that it was important to read the whole Bible, but you best never stray too far away from the Gospels. Because we're Jesus people. And we're defined by his life, death, and resurrection. This is what Dr. Wiles said about Dr. McGorman. He said, always be reading the Gospels. You want to watch Jesus, you want to listen to Jesus, you want to learn from Jesus, stay close to Jesus because we want to be like Jesus. You never stray far away from the stories of Jesus because they keep us close in step with his leadership in our lives. That's why Dr. Arterbury and Dr. Garland are just so dang holy. <laughs> the Apostle Peter says it like this, he says he was an eyewitness to the Lord Jesus Christ's majesty. How do we stay enrolled in the school of Christ? We lay witness to his majesty at work around us. We are attuned to his work in our lives. The writer of Hebrews says it like this. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We fix our eyes on him and nothing else. Indeed, this is the call of every Christian. Lifelong discipleship. Beholding, studying, focusing upon, and honoring Jesus Christ. It's the call of every Christian, but how much more is it the call of us called to shepherd the flock of God among us? Matthew 9 tells us that Jesus looked out upon the crowds and had compassion upon them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus Christ had every right to become callous. 
the people closest to him, his disciples, they were so frustratingly dense, it would have been easy for him to feel alone. Religious leaders and state leaders alike chose popularity and comfort over doing the right thing, and Jesus paid the price for it. In the end, everyone betrayed him at his final hour, and he was left to suffer alone. Jesus had every right to become callous, but instead he modeled for us in his life, death, and resurrection all that is embodied in this Ephesians text. Kindness, tenderheartedness, forgiveness. And because of example and through the power of his spirit, we can be like him. In fact, if you're a minister of the gospel, you must be like Jesus. There is no greater goal than to grow more and more into the image and likeness of Christ. Ryan and I are um, type B personalities. Are you familiar? We talk a lot about type A people because they get things done in the world. I get it. Type B are more relaxed <laughs> versus more driven. We're uh, more go with the flow. We're good, um, we're good, amiable people, but we're not always very structured. Or he's worried about what I'm about to say. I see it. Uh, very structured or rigid. And so there's this reality that uh, I love and admire, and I'm so glad to be married to Ryan, but it probably would have helped us both if we had married you know, someone with a little more structure in their lives because we end up uh, messy. Is that a fair way to say it? We're just kind of messy people. I'm just confessing that if you're normal people in ministry. Uh, but Ryan's dad is quite type A and quite structured, and Ryan's dad lives in Colorado. And so when um, messy, unstructured Ryan goes and spends time with his dad, he'll come back and he'll be like, okay, we got to clean the house, and he'll clean the house. And he'll, he's like, I'm going to get up and work out every morning. And he'll get up and work out every morning. And he'll go to the grocery store and he'll keep the house clean and keep everything structured. And there is something in Ryan that when he goes and spends time with a person who he admires and wants to emulate and wants to be like, he comes back changed. So it is with Jesus. We have to be like him. We must be like him. Or we need to find other jobs. We must be kind and tender and compassionate or we ought to hang up the hat. So how do we do it? We enroll every day in the lifelong learning of following Jesus. I'll close with this. At First Baptist Arlington, I don't know exactly what's going to look like for each of us to find our way back to the kind, compassionate way of Jesus, but we're going to do it and we're committed to work together to figure it out. But I wonder for you today, though, what commitment do you need to make to move from hard-hearted to tender-hearted? What do you need to do this semester to stay enrolled in the school of Christ above all other commitments? Who is it that you are withholding compassion from? Let's admit where we're at today. So whatever it is, May this seminary be the place which launches you on a trajectory of lifelong discipleship to Christ. May you utilize all the men and women here who want nothing more than that for you. And may you never fall into the pit of ceasing to care. And may you always be kind, compassionate, and forgiving in only the ways that following Jesus in transformative community can bring you. May it be so, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, and our coming King. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, may we be like you. May we be enrolled in the school of Christ every day of our life until the day you call us home. And Lord, only through your Spirit, can our hearts become uncalloused? And so we pray for your supernatural power to infuse our spirits, to embolden us, to help us be your people who glorify God by following your way in this world. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Will you stand as we continue to sing this morning?
worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. In Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, You are worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show. benediction, I feel we can't do any better than carrying on in Ephesians. So um, the beginning of Ephesians 5, therefore imitate God like dearly loved children. Live your life with love, following the example of Christ who loves us 
even when we grieve him and gave himself for us. Go in peace.